Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Okay, Christmas is coming and I've got some really cool wines for you to check out. I went with a theme that I've done in the past, wines to go with Italian food for Christmas. We don't do the standard American food. We pretty much do the Italian thing. And by that, we usually go to an Italian restaurant. If we don't, then we make Italian food at home. So all the wines for the show are Italian wines. Some may be easier to find than others. One I've had for a few years waiting to do a review, and that one will probably be the hardest to find. For the, rec for the record, I did buy all these wines. Okay, so first up, Bubbles. As many of you know, I love Bubbles. Italian bubbles don't get a lot of attention, and when they do, it's almost always Prosecco. Don't get me wrong, Prosecco is just fine, especially for that daily drinker. But today we're going to quote, do it right, with one of the most iconic Italian sparklers that use champagne method, Cada Bosco. It's a French Accorda. So why French Accorda? Well, it's one of the few Italian ap appellations that require what is known as the traditional method or champagne method to make wine. That means the bubbles come from a second intentional fermentation in the bottle rather than in a large tank or just added. The tank method is what's used for Prosecco. There is a second fermentation in a tank, so it's not like they just carbonate it with injecting CO2. Where is French Accorda? Well, it's in the Brescia province of the Lombardy region off of the Iseo Lake. While there is evidence of viticulture there dating back to at least the Roman times, it wasn't until the 1960s when modern viticulture started. It was the first DOCG for a wine that uses traditional method wines. They have five types. You have French Accorda, French Accorda Satine, French Accorda Rosé are the main three, and then French Accorda and French Accorda Rosé also allow the same grapes, but the Rosé requires 24 months of aging, whereas French Accorda only requires 18 months. Satin, or I guess a Satin, is stricter with the grapes allowed and requires 24 months of aging. Then you have French Accorda Milisimado and then French Accorda Reserva. Uh, yeah, Milisimado, I guess I said it right. Anyway, uh, they are the last two and both are vintage dated with aging requirements of 30 and 60 months respectively. For our purposes, we're only concerned with the first type, just French Accorda. The grapes allowed are three of the traditional champagne grapes, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Blanc. Yes, Pinot Blanc is one of the seven grapes of Champagne. It's part of, quote, the other four grapes that are not widely planted. There is also a new addition to the fold, a native grape called Herbamot. It's It was a grape that's been around since at least the 16th century. It's the last of the four to ripen, taking upwards of a month longer. Yet it retains its acidity, which is crucial for sparkling wine. Only a maximum of 10% is allowed in French Accorda, not Champagne. We're talking about French Accorda here. It can come in a range of sweetness levels, from driest to sweetest. You've got Paz Dose, same as Brut Natur, Extra Brut, Brut, Extra Dry, Sec or Dry, or Demi Sec. All right, so for the record, uh, when the Christmas episode comes, I'm sorry, the New Year's Eve episode comes up, I mistakenly said Extra Brut was the, dry, was the sweeter thing, I think. I don't know. I may have actually gotten it right. Anyway, what about Cal de Bosco? Well, along with Berlucci and Bella Vista, it's one of the best-known wineries in the region. In 1964, Anna Maria Clemente Zanella purchased a house on two hectares of land in Arbusco, Brescia. It's surrounded by oak and chestnut trees. No vineyards were there at the time. The first vineyards are planted in 1968. Over the next several years, different wines are introduced. In 1979, Anna Maria's son, Maurizio uh, Zanella, comes up with the idea of creating a vintage French Accord of Pinot. They continued to expand their portfolio of wines, and then in 1994, they joined Santa Margarita. But Maurizio stays on and is still there. They continue to advance their winemaking and adding new wines. In 1997, it looks like they started planting Carmenere, and that grape becomes officially part of the IGT Rosso del Sabino designation, starting with a 2008 vintage. So I definitely want to try that. 
I'm not opposed to getting a free sample, Maurizio. Hint, hint. Anyway, when it comes to the vineyards, they have over 250 hectares of vineyards now, all of which are certified organic as of 2014. They started doing this in 1989, so they started experimenting with it before it was, quote, cool. Their vineyards are spread out over 10 townships in French Accorda and average over 20 years of age. All grapes are hand harvested into small crates to avoid any premature crushing. When they get to the winery, the bunches are then hand sorted so that only the healthiest grapes are used. Cal de Bosco has what they call a grape spa. Essentially, they wash and dry the grapes to eliminate unwanted microorganisms, dust, and any residue from treatments. They began this in 2008. Even though they are certified organic, treatments are still organic, and I'm, I'm guessing they are just being extra careful. They are then refrigerated and cold pressed. This pressing is divided into three grades or quality levels. The highest level musts are also single vineyard. From this point, the musts are made into the desired wines. Fermentation, blend, aging, dosage, etc. are different for each wine. Once the wines have aged for the required amount of time, they are disgorged like in champagne, and then the appropriate dosage is added to replace the wine that was ejected when the cork was removed. That sounds simple enough, but these guys had to go out and reinvent the wheel. They invented and patented a corking machine that eliminates oxygen before they put the final cork in. This was patented in 2005. The reason for this is it cuts down on the sulfite content. It's not a low sulfite wine, just that at this point of the process, it appears that they don't have to add any SO2 to the finished wine. Whatever was naturally there or possibly added during the process is all that is left. So a side note on sulfites, I'm not going into a tirade. Here's the thing, and I'm totally guessing on this. Their goal isn't to cave into or imply that sulfites are going to affect people negatively. Their goal is to have the least amount possible to assure the wine taste is, quote, pure as possible. I don't like using the word pure, but that's the best way to explain it. Sulfites do affect the flavor and aromas of wines. Natty winemakers' aversion to using sulfites is more for this as a whole rather than worrying about someone's headache. Anyway, this wine is their main one. The entry level, so to speak, is in the sense that it's just a regular French Accorda, as if French Accorda could be called regular. <laughs> That's like calling champagne regular, dude. Anyway, even though these are wines, these wines are non-vintage dated, they are labeled as Edizione or Editions. Krug does something similar, and I love me some Krug. Anyway, let's get the stats of this wine. The non-vintage Cod de Bosco, Cuvée Prestige Edizione 47, French Accorda, about $40. It's the French Accorda DOCG. The varieties are 81.5% Chardonnay, 17% Pinot Nero, also known as Pinot Noir, 1.5% Pinot Bianco or Pinot Blanc. Grapes are sourced from 197 organic vineyards. The blend is 71% of the vintage wines uh, from 2019. Uh, 26 are reserved wines from 2018, and then three more percent is reserved wines from 2017. So what they do is they, they hold back a certain amount of wines from each vintage, so they have these reserved wines. It helps keep the non-vintage wines consistent. Fermentation is seven months in temperature-controlled stainless steel. Uh, then they're aged for 25 months on the lees. This one was disgorged in autumn of 2021. The dosage is extra brut, or 0 to 6 grams per liter of RS. They don't, give you, they don't give us the RS, they just tell us extra brute. The ABV is 12.8%. The pH is 3.11. The TA is 5 point, or total, total acidity is 5.8 grams per liter. The volatile acidity is 0 0.32 grams per liter. The total SO2 is a maximum of 55 milligram, milligrams per liter or 55 parts per million or PPN. Okay, a few extra notes here. First, vintage versus reserve means that this wine is effectively 71% percent from the 2019 vintage. I kind of already said this, but we're going to do a little more in depth. And then they were, then they used grapes that were held back intentionally from 2008 and 2017. Champagne does this for their non-vintage wines. They are required to hold back at least 20 percent of their harvest to be used in reserve. It serves as an insurance policy of sorts to combat poor vintages and having supply. It's not perfect, and we are going to see shortages soon due to lower yields the last few years in Champagne. We've just been spoiled with an abundance of champagne and the supply is basically going back to a more normal level, I guess. All right, then we have a disgorgement date. Why is that on there and why do we care? Well, when a wine like this is aged on the leaves, those leaves help remove oxygen from the wine. This greatly slows down the development, aka the oxidation of a wine. 
Once the wine has been disgorged, those leaves are what gets disgorged along with some wine. Hence why we have a dosage. That dosage can be bone dry, as in no sweetness at all, or it can be what makes the wine actually sweet. And this disgorgement date is essentially the equivalent of when a regular bottle of wine gets bottled. So this wine has a year of age in the bottle, and a year of aging like a normal wine, including the oxidation that will normally happen. It should still be pretty fresh and not have any major kind of oxidized flavors or aromas. Next, VA or volatile acidity. Normally, if I talk about this, it's in a negative way. Though Italian red wines are known to have some VA present, some French and Spanish wines will too. But that's, not, but that's not as common. Having it on a text sheet is a rarity, but all wine will have some VA. In this case, the VA is well below what, needs to be, what it needs to be. For the United States, it's 1.4 grams per liter maximum for reds and 1.2 grams per liter for whites. For the EU, it's 2 for reds and 1.8 for whites. Total SO2. This is a super rare stat to have on a tech sheet. I think I've only seen it one other time in the hundreds of wines I've reviewed here and hundreds, maybe even thousands of other tech sheets I've seen outside of my reviews. Their tech sheet shows this, but it also states that the concentration is indicated on the back label. And I could not find it. Now, for context, the maximum legal limit for quality sparkling wine, that was, there was a, a wine from a quality designation like DOCG, is 185 parts per million. I right, finally, what's up with this orange cellophane? So the most famous wine that does this is Vu Clicquot, or I guess it's Vuf Clicquot. Oh, idiot. Anyway, the, the bottle is a clear bottle. Uh, now, typically for many white wines, and that's typical for many white wines and rosés, but you've seen green and bo brown bottles too for wine. Well, just like beer, wine can be affected by light, ultraviolet light in this case. Colored glass helps prevent what is called light strike. It's not talked about as much with wine as it is in beer, where it causes that skunky beer taste. Beer is more susceptible to this than wine due to how hops interact with light. Uh, there's no hops in wine. So, uh, but in wine, we have what's called riboflavin, and that does react to light. In this case, it's not a skunky thing, but a sulfurous thing. Sulfur-containing amino acids become oxidized. Don't get this confused with sulfites. These are not, and they are not the same as far as I know. Links in the description for all of this for you. All right, moving on. Okay, so I'm not sure about this wine, as in this one here. It was a replacement wine from Underground Cellar. I don't know what my original wine was supposed to be, but they sent me three bottles of this wine to replace the wines I bought from them that they never got into my cellar. A couple red flags, the winery's website doesn't work, the URL works, and the sense that a page comes up, but, in a, but it is a page that says there's a critical error with the site and a link to troubleshoot it in WordPress. I did find an Italian website that sells the wine, and they say the drinking window ends in 2020. Oops. This is a 2016, and most white wines should last at least five-ish years. We are at six years, so it may be in decline. Underground Cellar says the value of the wine is $55, but that same Italian website says it sold for $12.70, for 12 or 12, 7, 12 cents. Don't get me wrong, it's always cheaper to buy a wine in its home country. I'm just a bit skeptical that a wine that sells for €12.70 sells for $55 here in the U.S. $25, $30? Yeah, I can, even, I can see that. Even $35, bucks, though, that's pushing it. With that said, this may be a killer wine. So what can I find out? Not much, but the Consorzio Vini Frascati website does have a few nuggets. The winery is called Azienda Agricola Lolavella. Uh, we are in the Lazio state of Italy. Not the most well-known for wine, but every state in Italy does make quality wines. From the Consorzio site, the Ovella is the farm founded in 1986 by Umberto Notarnicola and Bruno Violo in Frascati on the remains of an ancient peasant residence of the late 19th century that extended its possessions in the area of Colle Pisano, just halfway between Frascati and Monte Porzio Catone. The consortio site also states they farm organically and the vineyards are on the slopes of Monte Tuscolo. It's an ancient volcano near the actual winery. They list Bruno as the winemaker. And that's it. Let's just get the stats for the wine. The 2016 La Olivella Racimo Bio Bianco, 55 bucks, supposedly. For Scotty Superiore DOCG, varieties are 50% Mavazia 
Puntinata del Lazio, 20% Mavazia di Candia, then 20% Bologna, and 10% Grecchetto. The ABV is 13%. Yeah, I got nothing else. The, Malve the, Malvis the Malvasias are specific local varieties. I've never heard of Bologna. Uh, Grecchetto is somewhat familiar to me, but I had to look it up. Let's hope it's a good one. All right, last one. This is from Luigi Giordano. Giordano. Kind of like the, the pizza in Chicago, I guess. Everything started in the 1930s when Giovanni Giordano planted his first vines in the town of Barbaresco in 1936. In 1958, Giovanni's son Luigi decided to start making wine, hence the name of the winery. Luigi's daughter, Laura, or probably Laura, and his grandson, Matteo, are doing more of the day-to-day -day operations now. For the rest of the 20th century, Luigi acquired more vineyards around Barbaresco. Many of them are what he called crews or specific vineyard sites. Officially, they are called, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce this right, Menzioni Geografiche Agiontive. I probably butchered it. You just call it MGA. <laughs> anyway, a few notable MGAs that the winery makes wine from are Asile, Monte Stefano, Cavana, Orvello, Ronchi, and Cars. Like the Cars, like the song? Anyway, like, you know, the Gary Newman one. Anyway, the winery makes a single vineyard wine from Cavana that is considered its best known wine. I, I've, I've seen that wine. For this wine, all the grapes come from the town of Barbaresco. The Longue Rosso DOC is used instead due to the winemaking process uh, more than the origin of the grapes. This style of wine tends to be a more approachable version of Nebbiolo, the grape used in Barbaresco and Barolo. Nebbiolo can be a very tannic wine. It makes wines that look like Pinot Noir, but hit your gums like Tanat. Oftentimes it takes a minute or two or five or 10 for me to register the tannin, while others feel it quickly. Let's see the stats for this wine. The 2021 Luigi Giorgiano Longue Rosso for 20 or 20, between 20 and $23. The Longue DOC, the varieties are 80% Nebbiolo, 20% Arnais. It might be Arnais, but I'm pretty sure it's Arnais. It's destemmed. The maceration is 15 to 20 days. Fermentation in stainless steel tanks. The grapes are co-fermented. Aging is one year in stainless steel and concrete. The ABV is 13%. Okay, let's check out the wines. All right, so, you know, I kind of go back and forth when I'm going to do these specials and what I'm going to do for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. And I try to, a lot of times, just go by, what do I have? It's loud. What do I have already in the house? Just to try to be, you know, frugal. Now, I mean, I've bought, I buy wine throughout the year and there we go. Throughout the year and all that. All that noise. Anyway, um, but I, I decided I was going to do Italian. So I had this one and I've been wanting to review it for a while. Okay. And then I was like, Let's do French Quarter. Let's do the most iconic that I know of, the one that I'm most familiar with. So I had a call around, and my buddy Austin over at High Street um, was able to uh, secure me a bottle. Thank you, Austin. I did get a little bit of a discount, but uh, the price I told you is, is the normal price. And then uh, I also bought this one from High Street because I was like, I need, a, I need a red. I'm looking at it, and I recognize the producer and the Cavana, and I was like, yeah, but I don't wanna spend a lot of money, so, you know, did that one instead. So I probably had Ca Del Bosco, Ca Del Bosco a couple times, maybe a half dozen times at most over the years. But yeah, if you're gonna do anything, you know, any type of French Corda, first of all, this is going to be the one you're probably going to get asked about on an exam. Okay. Especially like a certified or an intro exam. I mean, at the level I'm working on um, advanced, it's very likely I might get asked about some other ones, but I mean, really realistically, you know, there's only a few, maybe five total I need to be familiar with. This one, I was, this one here, you know, I'll be honest, for every once in a while I look at it in my in my cellar, my non-functioning cellar, um, I think it's like a red wine because it's a dark glass. Um, 
and it kind of looks like a red wine, but then I realized it's a white wine. And then this one, again, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to try some of this. I know the producer, I haven't had a lot of wines from the producer, but um, I know it's a good quality or excellent, more like excellent quality producer. And I know that the Corvin adds carbonation and all that, but it feels like there's more carbonation in there than normal. All right. So just a typical Italian Christmas. Honestly, I'm probably going to have some of these for um, a Thanksgiving. I don't know. You see, when you see my when you see my uh, New Year's episode, you're going to see me talk about using those for Thanksgiving because I'm recording all these right before Thanksgiving. Make sure I do that for Corvin. Uh, I haven't mentioned in a while, but thank you, Corvin. Uh, they sent me a re I, my my original one that I bought many many years ago, crapped out. I did complain a little bit on the show, uh, but I had a lot of back and forth with them on uh, email explaining what the problem was, and they were kind enough to send me a replacement for free. So I, I need to give them props every once in a while because I love I love the product. I mean, I obviously use it. So uh, yeah. Anyway, so let's get to the Cade Bosco. So um, you know, just a kind of a, just a, a yellow color, uh, not quite golden. Also, side note. Uh, I'm recording during the day, so I'm recording these in reverse. I'm recording New Year's first, Christmas, and I'm recording Thanksgiving next. And for a little while, the sun was over here. And as I was done with the New Year's Eve episode, I realized that you can see you could see like the sun hitting the, the blue screen in the back. So I put some stuff on the side there. Now it looks like the sun has moved over enough. So I have a feeling I'm going to do the same thing for the Thanksgiving episode because the sun's going to be like right in my face here in probably like an hour. I always seem to throw in inside baseball occasionally, but anyway, uh, it's got some really good bubbles on here. They're, they are pretty, they're holding it pretty well. Uh, similar to the champagne you'll, you'll see in the new year's Eve episode. Yeah. It has a very much a champagne uh, aroma to it. Um, and I think having done the new year's Eve episode ones and the variety of grapes that are in that, I do a champagne. And I think, I think the champagne varieties, the Chardonnay and the Pinot really help give you that that bakery that pastry type of smell because all those wines are aged on lees um so yeah so the what the happens is the lees gives you this it, it eats up all the oxygen but it also imparts the the bakery aroma thing and then when you then when you disgorge it then you get that extra oxidation going on but you've got that pomaceous fruit so you got more like green apple rather than yellow apple it's not too bruised. It's not that oxidized. I mean, it's only been, been disgorged for a year. But it's really just like green apples, a little bit of bakery stuff. Um, and you, you can smell the carbonation. Touch of floral, but not a whole lot on the nose. It's really not aromatic. It's not as aromatic as some other stuff. Let's just taste it. Mmm. It's so fresh. Fresh, fresh, and exciting. Anyway, um, so now it's more like a now it's more like a like a Jolly Rancher green apple thing. Not sweet, but it's got that green apple flavor, but in a Jolly Rancher style, right? Um, and you kind of wrapped it up in a croissant, I guess, or or like a. Um, you know what? You know what it's like. Okay, so it's like getting like a um, not a donut, but like some type of like like pastry that's like a muffin or I don't know how, how to describe it. Um, God, it, I, the name's coming. Name's gonna kill me because I, I know what I want to describe it as. But some type of pastry with green apple in it, and it's kind of like got a like a like a icing, and but it's also got that caramelization. Like the green apple is caramelized. It's kind of like that. Yeah. And then you get, again, caramel in here. And then you get uh, the florals in there. You also get some orange, some tangerine, some peach. While it's not a sweet wine, I can see you doing this with like cookies. Like I could see you doing this at the end of something. Though it'll make, these things need to be not super sweet. They need to be kind of the drier side. So they can't be like super sweet cookies, but I have a feeling it, 
flavor wise, it seems like it would go well, but honestly, it would just, it would, everything could probably turn bitter. And you probably don't want to do it, but if you want the flavors, you could do it. With that said, for sure, salads. I mean, obviously, so you could do this like with a, with a, with a apple cider vinaigrette. Um, you can do it like a ras raspberry vinaigrette. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but something that's kind of like that, that kind of, that style of dressing, an Italian dressing, something that's got a little bit of acidity, a little bit of bite to it. Um, I guess you could do it with like a Caesar dressing if you wanted to. Uh, I wouldn't do it with ranch or Thousand Island or French or anything like that. But you can do like an Italian dressing, Italian base dressing, like, you know, Caesar's dressing was actually not made in Italy. It was invented in, I think it was actually invented in Mexico because the guy's name was Caesar. Um, I mean, you do Caesar dressing, you could do Italian dressing, you could do a, a, a vinaigrette of some sort, like a champagne, raspberry vinaigrette. Ooh, yeah, that'd be good. Um, <clears throat> you could also do it as your, during your first course. So if you have like an appetizer, you like say, say a, um, I mean, the fancy name is charcuterie, but antipasto. So, because they put all kinds of stuff, they put olives on there and peppers and, and meats and cheeses. And yeah, you do antipasto, this would go great with that because the acidity will really help break through the fats of the meats and the cheeses um, and really complement like any of the other things like the olives, the saltiness of the olives really complement that. Oof. We don't normally do antipasto because we just buy this. Well, I mean, okay, so we're going to be going to a restaurant in, in most likely probably Luce. We either go to Luce or Paisano's. We'll probably go, we'll go to one of them. But yeah, this would be great with 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 your first course type of thing. You could also do it with pasta, straight up, like you know, a, a pasta with like a cream sauce, like an Alfredo or maybe a piccata. Do you like a chicken or a veal piccata? That'd be great. All right, so on the frascati. So it's got, so the colors are pretty, they're pretty comparable. Okay, even though this has got six years of age on it, so it does look like it's more of an oxidized yellow. But um, other than that, let's just check it out. Okay, so far so good. It doesn't smell faulted or flawed or just old. You do get a bit of that bruised fruit. It's a yellow apple type of thing. Get some peach, a bit of orange, but there's also like a waxiness to it, like a wax apple. And wax sometimes might be an indicator of botrytis. I didn't, from reading everything about Frascati wines, there's no chance there's Botrytis on this. I mean, there was always a chance, but yeah, there's no Botrytis. But there's a little bit of waxiness to it. A little bit, ooh, a little bit of flint, a little bit of smoke. Just got, got like a little bit of, just a touch of sulfurous, like a little match strike. But more flinty than like, like, you know, like an actual match. Yeah, kind of gravelly. It's kind of like walking on gravel. Like, you know, sometimes you, if you go to like a, um, you go somewhere that has a lot of gravel and there's like a, there's like a smell to that. It's also like this, like, uh, I want to say like peppermint. It's, 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 a, it's a dustiness to it. It's, but it's like almost like a little bit of a peppermint, but mixed in with like crushed rock. A little bit of uh, smokiness to it. Oh, this, this, this might be, this might be like the shocker of the group. All right, let's taste it. Mmm. It's fantastic. Wow, and I have two more bottles of this. Holy cry money. I try to keep my adult language to a minimum, but you could insert a few um, F-bombs in here right now. Um, so it is oxidized, okay, but it's oxidized like it's supposed to be. It's got that bruised yellow apple. It's got a bit of bruised peach, nectarine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like the orange and, oh, yeah. It almost, now it starts to remind me of, of, of an aged Riesling. Ooh. Wow. There's a spice component to it. It's almost like a, um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't, I can't exactly identify frankincense and myrrh, but it has that kind of church, like the, like the smoke that they do, like in Catholic churches, that kind of incense type of aroma to it. So I don't know if that's, you know, frankincense, myrrh and whatever the other, whatever the thing with Christmas, <laughs> there you go. Um, 
yeah, it's got like a like a exotic spice thing going on. It's really faint. It's not overpowering. I mean, this is this needs to be drank pretty much now. Like it could age probably another couple of years at most, but it is on the decline. Well, it's it's peaking. It's 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 peaked. It's it's at its plateau. It's not gonna get any better. Let's put it that way. At least I don't think it will. But it needs to be drank now. So probably in 2020 it peaked. Or around 2020, like two years have probably peaked. And now it's kind of like it's plateaued and it's like it's holding on for dear life. It's like I got a little bit more, and it's like Tom Brady retired and said, I'm coming back to do more. And he's not doing so hot. Well, he did win that game in 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 uh, uh in Munich. Anyway, uh, I'm excited to drink more of that. All right, let's get into the Nebbiolo. Man, I know you can't really see, but I'm gonna try to try to get it as close as I can. Can you see how light that is? So it is very much like a cherry water. And so when I would look, if I saw this in a, in a blind, I mean, first thought is Pinot Noir, okay? This is why it's it's very much the Pinot Noir look-alike of, of Italian wines. There is a touch of orange to it. It's not really old. It's like 20... What was the age? What was the vintage? 21. So it doesn't really have any age to it. But Italian wines tend to get orange really quickly. There's a touch. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, I necessarily see orange, but there's a, there is an oranging to it. So that would that would automatically make me go, okay, it's either a Pinot Noir with a little bit of age, or we're talking Nebbiolo or Sangiovese. But yeah, it is it is a very much red orange ish type of thing. Very translucent. All right, let's give it a shot. Ooh, this is pretty. So you got a little bit of a spice rack going on here. Uh, you've got this cinnamon clove. I mean, it's not overly oaked, but it's it's it's. I think this is more from the variety rather than oak. But you've got that. You got some red and black fruit going on. There it is a touch of cherry and cranberry, dry, raspberry. There's an earthiness to it. Not quite poopy, but a bit of earthiness. There is a touch of volatile acidity that I would expect from Italian wine. I talk about volatile acidity a little bit more in um, the Christmas episode, so be sure you watch that. Yeah, um, it's very tart on the red fruit, but earth and spice smells wonderful. But it's light, it's not overpowering. I would call it like a medium minus on the aroma. Like I really gotta stick my nose in here to smell it, I just taste it. As per usual, first attack, Nothing, like no tannin whatsoever. I'm like, I'm blind to this. I'm going Pinot Noir, maybe Gamay. So I'm thinking it might be your Grenache. Alcohol is a little bit elevated. No, not really. It's 13 and a half. I just kind of feel a little bit. Yeah, 13. Um, but yeah, I'd be like, maybe not Grenache because it's not high octane. So I wouldn't be thinking like Vacares, Vacares, Vacaras, Vacaras. Yeah, I've been making my maps. Um, Chat, maybe not, definitely not Chateau Neuf. I wouldn't be thinking that. Maybe not, I wouldn't think Cote d'Arone. But, so I'd be thinking Gamay, Burgundy, all day long on this. But it's super light in color. But what take me away is it doesn't have the true earthiness of Burgundy. And it doesn't have the Christmas in the glass necessarily of Beaujolais. And it's got to touch that VA. And the fruit is more on the cranberry and raspberry, blackberry, than it is on the cherry. So that would probably take me back to Italy. And at that point, I'd be like, okay, where? And because it is so light and the tannin really hasn't hit me, whereas Sangiovese hits me a little bit sooner than Nebbiolo, I would be probably thinking this is Nebbiolo, but probably Longue. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't put this in a Barolo or Barbaresco style. But as I'm talking, the tannin is building up. This is what Nebbiolo tannin does to me. It tricks me. It tricks me into thinking it's Pinot or Gamay or even Grenache. And then it goes, no, 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 no. You got to wait for it. Mm -hmm. And now it's really building. It's one of those things, if I don't have any wine going on, it, 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 it sticks around. It's delicious. It's a tricky wine because you think you should have this really light food, but as you drink it, it gets more and more tannic. So you need something with lots of like good fat. So like the Ville Cristina that I'm probably eating 
uh, for Thanksgiving um, would be great with this. But on a Christmas side of things, you definitely could, I mean, pasta, of course, pasta and red sauce is an absolute must with this. If you want to do a steak pizzaiola, you could do something like that. If you want to do a, um, a, 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 a veal, a veal with a, not quite like an Alfredo, but like veal Parmesan type of things. So you got the cheese, the Parmesan, you got the red sauce and you kind of, yeah, be great with that or chicken, you know, do a veal. Um, yeah, that's going to be wonderful. Now, if you want to do like traditional, like Thanksgiving, I'm sorry, Christmas fair, Thanksgiving, the same thing. But if you want to do turkey or ham, absolutely would go with this. Uh, same thing with this. Definitely the ham and turkey. This, again, first course stuff. If you're going to do more traditional stuff, um, pot roast, Chateau Briand would be great with this um, type of thing. It would be awesome with that. All right. You know what? It's going to do it for this year's Christmas special. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe. And tell all your friends, and we'll see you next time. I'm super like impressed with this.